Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate the efforts you're all making to be here for this session. We would like to begin by acknowledging that many of our organizations occupy unceded land of our First Nations communities. CHEO is situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation, and for that, we are thankful. My name is Gisèle Paquette, and I am one of the System Navigator Hub Specialists on the ECHO Ontario Child and Youth Mental Health Team, and I will be facilitating today's session. Some housekeeping items to note. Please ensure you are muted. There will be a red line through the microphone icon at the bottom left of your screen. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, send a message to Roxanne Mackay in the chat function. The archived materials from today's session will be posted to our website as soon as they are available at the link provided in the chat box for you. We have three, over 300 participants who have signed up to attend today's session from all across Ontario and wanted to thank you all for submitting your questions in advance for our hub specialist panel today. Due to the number of attendees, we will not be able to answer any questions live within the session or questions submitted in the chat box. Many of the questions you submitted will be covered during the presentation portion from Dr. Michael Chang and Cindy Dawson, and there are a select number of questions the Hub Specialist Panel will be answering in the second portion of today's session. Even though we may not be addressing each individual question, there were many themes that emerged from um, the information um, that we will share today, and hopefully we'll be able to answer the content of your questions and provide you with helpful information. At this time, we'll do a quick introduction to each hub specialist, beginning with Dr. Michael Chang. Hi, Mike Chang, Child's. Hi there, it's Mike Chang, Child Psychiatrist at CHEO. Good to meet everyone. Hello, it's Simone Corte. I'm a psychologist uh, at CHEO. Hi, I'm Cindy Dawson. I'm one of the system navigators on the hub. Welcome. Hi, I'm Christy Kopchik. I work at PLEO, and I'm a family peer support provider. Hi, I'm Elise Shipper. I'm the Executive Director at PLEO. This session is presented in partnership with ECHO Ontario Child and Youth Mental Health at CHEO and PLEO. Here you find a joint slide about PLEO and ECHO partnership for this session. Here are some links to general information as there were some questions about basic needs, financial support, and accessing autism resources. Please note that our ECHO friends at Holland Bloorview are offering sessions to parents and caregivers around the topic of autism. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Chang to present on the Pandemic Parenting Playbook. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us during this unprecedented time. So remember once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away, parenting sometimes looked like this. And then along came COVID. I still remember exactly where I was when I was told they were going to shut down the schools and I thought someone was just playing a joke on me. And here we are several weeks later in the new world of COVID parenting. And it's really funny how our our friends who don't have kids are talking about learning new languages, learning new cooking skills, and as parents, we're just trying to survive. And although it's unprecedented, the good thing is that parents are good at unprecedented. And then the other joy, as well, is the new world of COVID homeschooling, just to make things even more fun. So let's talk about Dave. Dave is a 14-year-old teenager and I'm sure we all know Dave. Uh, Dave says the virus, I'm so sick and tired of it. Uh, I'm going to see my friends, you can't really stop me. I'm not gonna get sick. Uh, and uh, you know that stupid bylaws officer, he had no right giving me a ticket. Parents are exhausted, they're financially stressed out, they're just trying to survive. They try to reason with him but Dave just doesn't seem to get it. What would you recommend to help Dave and his parents? So Let's first start by talking about what we all need for mental wellness first and foremost. So for mental wellness, also known as resiliency, we need our basic needs to be met. We need healthy food, we need housing, 
We also need face-to-face -face contact with one another. We need nature, time outside. We need physical activity. We need sleep. And we also have higher needs, such as we need a sense of belonging, purpose, meaning, and hope. Belonging is, as a human species, we are a social species. We need to feel connected to other people that love and care for us. We also need a sense of purpose. We all need something to do in life because if we just sat around all day, we'd be miserable. So our shared purpose from all of us here is actually we're all parents. And that's one of the things which gives us a sense of purpose and keeps us busy. For our kids, their sense is being a student, being a son, a daughter. We also need a sense of meaning and hope. Definitely during this time, we need a sense of knowing that things are gonna get better, that we're making a difference, that we're doing our best. And we also need a sense of healthy stresses in our life. In other words, people just can't sit around all day. They need some stress and they need just enough stress to challenge them so that they can grow and be stimulated enough. And in terms of teenagers, they all need these things as well. However, in addition to that, they also need more of a sense of independence and autonomy. In other words, they don't just want adults telling them what to do. They want to feel that they're in charge and that they have choices over things. And another part about being a teenager is that they all need a sense of belonging and connection. However, as they are teenagers, it is natural that they want to connect more to people outside the family and friends and activities outside the family become more important. And this is why COVID has been stressful because COVID has made it harder for us to easily access food. For some people, it's threatened their housing. COVID has also made it harder outside of our immediate families to have face-to-face -face contact with other people. And even when you're around other people nowadays, you're often wearing a mask. So it's harder to see those nonverbals. It's also, for some people, made it harder to access nature and outdoor time. It's made people more exhausted, so often it's harder to sleep. And it has also made it harder for some people to have a sense of belonging, purpose, and meaning and hope. One of the advantages about having a family, interestingly enough, is at the end of the day, we still have to carry on, and our purpose is to be parents. Now, people can react in many different ways when they're under stress. And so some of the classic ways that we react when we're grieving a loss or dealing with a stress are first, denial. So we may first deny that something is happening and that's actually very protective for some people. We may also move into a, what we call a fight or flight response. So fight is when we get angry about something. We may blame, we may um, get frustrated about something. We may also move into a flight response, which is getting worried or scared about something. And whenever we have a loss, and COVID has caused a loss of a lot of things, loss of our previous lives, loss of our previous routines, we can also get sad. A sadness is a classic reaction when you lose something. And interestingly enough, crying is actually one of the most powerful innate strategies that human beings have to deal with severe loss and stress. The hope is that when we can successfully cope with things, we move into a sense of acceptance. So you either have to change the stress or you accept it. And when the stress is not too excessive, we can accept the new reality. And then we can hopefully cope in more healthy ways. Healthy ways include helping other people, being altruistic, volunteering. Unhealthy ways include hedonism and focusing merely on pleasure and just medicating our problems away with screen time or other things. So how stressful has COVID been? Well, it's actually been very stressful for a lot of people. 45%, so almost half of people feel it's made their mental health worse. Uh, half of people feel it's made no difference. Interestingly enough, about 7% of people think it's actually improved their mental health. And this was a survey done on adults, but we can probably extrapolate many of these results to kids as well and teens. Interestingly enough, in terms of behaviors, most people are watching more TV, spending more time online, uh, having changes in eating habits, less exercise. Uh, many of us are having more video games. There's often more tension in the household. And there's also an increased use of substances and alcohol and gambling as a way of coping as well. 
And interestingly enough, there's also 9% who are not coping with any of the above. And so to those 7% or 9%, uh, it, is, it is clearly interesting that there's some people that are stronger as a result of this stress and more resilient. Next slide. So what are some of the usual basic first things we recommend to parents for COVID? So one of the first things is first you have to look after yourself because as we know, if your cup is empty, it's hard to provide for your kids. So we often use the analogy, put on your own oxygen mask. We also ask that people have self-compassion. So it's a hard time. So lower your expectations. Don't be critical and blame yourself because we're often our worst uh, critic, worst enemy. And it's important that we take care of ourselves first because if your own needs are met first, then it's more likely you'll be able to stay calm and not yell at the kids and show compassion and caring for them. It's hard to do that if you yourself are exhausted and tired. And because parenting is a tough job, one of the other things we recommend to parents are look in your support network and see if there's other people that can help support you even if they can't support you face to face, even if they can only help you out remotely, like zoom in and have contacts with your kids, like having your grandparents spend time with your kids on FaceTime. It's something that gives you a bit more time. And then the other big thing, other than focusing on what you can control is the opposite. Don't focus on what you cannot control. So we hear this a lot. Don't focus on what other people are doing. Don't focus on what you can or cannot find at the store. And don't focus on what other people think about what you're doing either. So has this happened to any of you? So uh, prior to COVID, I used to say to families, please um, try and limit screen time on school days to no more than zero to one hours a day, you know, than one to two hours a day of recreational screen time. But uh, definitely during COVID, I think we would say probably no more than 14 hours a day of screen time is fine. So that just goes to speak to the fact that definitely this is an unprecedented time and we have to be more flexible. And so we do have to accept that sometimes things just go um, and, and we go lax in terms of expectations. Nonetheless, on the other hand, one of the basic things we recommend to families is try and pull things back by thinking about a schedule. Uh, thinking about a schedule is important because otherwise our human tendency is to just let things go. And so we can have a conversation with our kids. Uh, with, with younger kids, we would just give a schedule, but with teens, it often helps to involve them in the conversation. So that's why we might ask them, what do we need every day to be healthy? What do we need in terms of meals, uh, outdoor time, physical activity? What do we need about uh, learning activities, social routines, sleep? And this is where we will also make sure that there's time built in so that parents can get their time to get their stuff done. And because we're dealing with teenagers, we have this idea of non-negotiable and negotiable expectations. So non-negotiable would be schoolwork is something you have to do. And however, I'm flexible about when exactly you do your schoolwork. Teenagers are getting older, and in many primitive societies, teenagers uh, were living independently and having their own families. So we can definitely try and appeal to our teens' need for purpose and to be valued and to be busy. And we can appeal to that by asking them uh, and letting them know how important their role is. I appreciate you helping out. I need you to take on more chores and responsibilities. I know I can count on you. And at the end of the day, a schedule is something flexible. It's not a tool meant to cause more stress. It's something that is custom to whatever family and situation you have. So there's tons of examples of schedules on the internet. Uh, for some families, it might be a bit more of a, a structured schedule with hourly slots. And then in other families, it's more flexible. It's more a guideline of, to do's and a wish list for what you'd like to have done in the morning, noon, or the evening. So, in some cases, a schedule can make a huge difference, and sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes, even despite that, your teen is still struggling with having healthy routines and healthy, healthy activities. So, in those cases, 
one of the tools that we recommend to try is to think about what we call self-regulation and to create a self-regulation plan. So let's talk a bit about what self-regulation is. This is something that a lot of us just do automatically and we don't even think about it. But the truth is it's actually a skill and it's not something that comes naturally to all teenagers. So self-regulation is many things. It's the ability to stay calm and then the green. Actually, sorry, can we just go back to the previous slide? Sorry about that. So it's the ability to stay calm and in the green zone. And when we're calm, that's the best place to be to function. On the other hand, there's other zones as well. There's a bored zone when we're not stimulated enough. There's a yellow zone when we get stressed and irritated and annoyed. And there's also a red zone when we get overwhelmed. There's other zones as well, but for today's presentation, we're just focusing on a few of them. Now we can go to the next slide. So now let's talk in a bit more detail about each of these zones. So boredom is something I know we all hear from our children these days. I'm bored, there's nothing to do. Uh, you know, definitely losing a chunk of school from nine to three o'clock uh, means there's many more hours that have to be filled. And so it's not surprising that many teens are complaining that they're bored or understimulated. And as a result, some of them are good about being able to seek out healthy ways and unfortunately, others seek out unhealthy ways to deal with their need for stimulation, like fighting with their siblings, destroying things, uh, excess video game time, excess screen time. So what can we do? Well, we can definitely allow boredom in the hope that this will encourage them to be creative. Otherwise, we may also need to purposely think about giving them activities, experiences, routines that give them enough stimulation such as enough sensory input, emotional stimulation, social stimulation. So I remember as a kid, uh, you would never complain to your grandparent because then they would give you chores every time you say you're bored. And at this point, I'll pass it on to um, Cindy for resources. Yeah, so my role is just to kind of give a few resources um, that might be helpful in these different zones. So in this case, I found a few websites that um, have some really neat activity ideas involved with them. So um, parenting teenagers, those kinds of things. Um, also, a lot of people are using cahoots these days, and they can be a lot of fun if you're making them as a family. Um, and the Ontario Science Centre has some great uh, do-it-yourself activities if your children are more into science. Um, as opposed to more sports and other related activities. So we appreciate for each of these zones, it can definitely get much more complicated. And we thank your understanding that this is merely an overview. Another important zone is the green zone. So this is where we want to be. The purpose of self-regulation is get to getting to this green zone for ourselves as parents, so that then we can also be in the green zone and model that for our kids. When we're, when we're in the green zone, that's when our rational, our logical brain functions. And so when that logical, rational brain is functioning, then we're able to do activities, we're able to socialize with people, our teens are then open to talking about things and being logical. So what can we do to make sure our kids stay in the green zone? Well, we can make sure that in our daily schedules, we have healthy activities like sleep, like outdoor time, like social time, that can help get their brains to this green zone. During these times, this is when we can talk to them about possible issues or stresses that came up, conflicts that happened. And as a parent, we often want to give advice to our teen. If you're gonna give advice, the best time is in the green zone. Uh, but even then, it's helpful to ask for permission prior to giving your teen advice. Over to you, Cindy. So I found uh, some neat resources around um, like yoga activities that are um, beginner level yoga. So if you want to encourage them to get involved in something like yoga or engage with them in activities such as, you know, going for a walk, those kinds of things. Um, I love make moments meaningful so the idea of walking with somebody or engaging in a game of catch with somebody provides opportunity for those discussions these apps that I'm mentioning in the next few slides you'll notice the mood mission for example gives them an a mission um, activity to do that uh, 
is coincides with how they're reporting their mood. So this would be a great time for them to actually start looking at these apps when they're calm and um, just get a feel of whether or not they work for them. MindShift is a, um, uses CBT cognitive behavior therapy principles. So great uh, mental health app. Um, Healthy Minds is a problem solving app and it's uh, run through the Royal Do It For Darren program. Breathe to Relax goes into more um, activities that engage them to learn to breathe, learn to cope, and it increases their coping skills. And introducing these while they're calm is really helpful. Also might be a time, especially if you've had problems before where you needed a safety plan, it's a great opportunity to look at safety planning and making sure so that it becomes comfortable for them. They're a lot more engaged when they're in this green zone. Other great websites that I would encourage you to to look at along with your child is Anxiety Canada, eMentalHealth.ca, and Excel at Life. And again, these are all apps or information websites that have um, information about anxiety disorders or mental health disorders, as well as encouraging healthy mental health. Thanks, Cindy. So the yellow zone is when we start to get stressed out. And when we get stressed out, this is when our brain starts getting emotional. And when we're emotional, we're less likely to be open to logic and rational thought. So this helps us understand why, as parents, we often learn that when our kids are stressed out, we should try and help them to do deep breathing. But sometimes if people are getting stressed out, then they're not as rational. So during those times, they're not going to be as open to doing deep breathing. They're also not going to be as open to our logic. So our logic might be, well, if you don't do your homework, you're going to fail. Well, if you don't do this, then this consequence is going to happen. Unfortunately, when people are emotional, they're not able to process those things logically. And then that may actually make things worse if they feel threatened. So what can we do? We can start with connection before direction, also known as giving them emotional support, not solutions. And so what that means is before we give our brilliant advice, we may need to give them emotional validation. Yes, I hear that you're wanting to see your friends. It's stressful when you can't. And we validate the heck out of their feelings until they feel a bit better. You look sad. Let me give you a hug. Here's a Kleenex. Crying is amazing. If our kids can cry, then that helps the brain accept the stresses that are difficult to accept. And when, the, when a person is in this yellow zone, this frustration zone, we try not to give them uh, directives or too much advice. So we try not to say things like, you need to take some space, you need to take your deep breathing, because that actually can trigger them to feel threatened and then things get worse. Over to you, Cindy. Exactly what Mike was saying is around the idea of encouraging the use of the apps that they've already kind of played with a bit, but again, not saying you need to use what we talked about. It really a lot of a we thing, we statements saying, you know, let's look at this together, or is this a good time? And really asking permission before you're encouraging them to follow through with whatever app or whatever plan you have. But again, trying to refer to, to what they've already uh, established when they were calm. Yes, and I'll just make a quick addition that Cindy mentions, uh, refer to the safety plan. So the safety plan is where ahead of time in the green zone, we've written down what would be helpful when things get stressful. And so when a child can actually see in their own handwriting, their own printing that they have suggested when I get upset, I should go to my room or I can listen to my breathing app or whatever, then that's helpful. Then it's not coming from outside, it's coming from them. So if stresses continue, or if we have overwhelming stresses, then that can actually drop our brains down into what we call the red zone. So the red zone is our fight or flight response, which we all have as hunter gatherers and human beings. The red zone, the fight or flight response, is actually something that helped us survive as hunter gatherers. It was not an easy world in the old days. We were constantly getting attacked by dangerous wild animals. And when you got attacked by a wild animal, your body's alarm needed to go off so that you could go into the fight or flight response so that your body could make adrenaline so that you could fight the danger uh, or take flight and run away from it. And so the difference though is that we no longer live in that hunter-gatherer society, we live in modern society. And the challenge is that our 
modern society uh, has different types of stresses. So this fight or flight response doesn't work as well in modern society in helping us. So we can work around that. So this helps us understand why when our teens are really upset, when they're aggressive, when they're verbally aggressive, when they're physically aggressive, or when they're just running away, it tells us that they're in the red zone. And so in those times, we definitely know that logic is not going to work. Threatening them is not going to work. Uh, and this also helps us understand why during these times, even giving a hug, even why empathy may also not work during these times because they're at such a primitive level. So what do we usually recommend? Recommendations might be, well, is there fighting between people? This is where people need to take space and reduce that sensory overload. Uh, we can also dim the lights, make it quieter, help, help people not gather around. Uh, don't insist that people talk about things. If your child needs to run away or go to their room, as long as they're safe, we let them do that. We stay around to keep an eye on things, but they need space. And we um, can cushion any separation by reassuring them. You know, we can say, we're all going to take some space. Love you. We'll work through this. We'll check in in a few minutes. Over to you, Cindy. Cindy. So this is where we will have already talked about the safety plan um, before, but being aware of crisis lines is really important because in the moment you want to make sure you have those readily available so that you know when they get to this point, if there's a safety concern, then you're going to call uh, and activate the crisis lines, even if it's for your own support to manage the situation. Um, so, you know, locally there is a crisis line where you can call and just talk to somebody about how to potentially handle the situation and it might help regulate you as well. So you'll see that there is a Canadian suicide prevention service as well as um, a crisis line um, link on here as well that you can hyperlink for next or when you're planning. So we've talked about different zones and there's other zones as well, but those are some of the main zones. And the next step after thinking about the zones is if your child is struggling with self-regulation, they're struggling with moods or getting upset easily, then this is where we want to write all these things down. When they're in the green zone, we write their self-regulation plan down on paper. Uh, and there's many templates online that you can use. And here's a link to one that you can fill out. So if we're lucky and the stresses aren't too severe, then hopefully the various strategies we've mentioned will be very helpful. Nonetheless, sometimes in more severe cases and situations, things don't get better. When do we know we need to seek professional help? So if you notice that your team is having issues that are problematic, that are causing problems in their day-to-day -day life, if it's a persistent issue, that it's not just going away, it's lasting several weeks, if it's pervasive, meaning that it's not just you and your child that are having this issue, but your child has this issue with other adults as well in other settings, not just at home, but maybe in the community, school, then that might suggest the issue is something we need more help with. And so the good news is mental health services are still available under COVID. Most of them are virtual rather than physical, but they're still available. So a great resource that you can find online and they have info sheets on a lot of different things. You'll just see on this uh, slide that I've actually highlighted um, the info sheets tab. It basically gives you information on a variety of different mental health topics, some including wellness topics, others are more specific like depression and anxiety. So feel free to check out this website and see if you can find some things that are interesting. With regards to supporting families as well, um, there's a few websites that uh, I found over the years that have worked really well. Healthline.ca um, for each region has a child and youth specific uh, mental health as well as some health care um, resources. So uh, if you go to healthline.ca, you'll be able to look up your region and then find resources. Um, Connects Ontario is um, 
uh, refer is basically for talking about people with mental health issues or addictions issues. So you can take a look for there and it'll give you local resources. It's like uh, more of a government website. And then the Children's Mental Health Ontario um, is specifically to child and youth mental health topics and it's a resource platform. And then School Mental Health Ontario is about um, how to advocate and promote child, children's mental health within the school. So if you are your child struggling in that area, then that's a great website to look at. Other websites that are fantastic are Anxiety Canada. Um, one of the apps I talked to you about, um, Mind uh, Shift is from Anxiety Canada. And so they're, they have lots of great information about, uh, and some uh, role plays and dialogues in there too, which are really uh, interesting and help give you the language to deal with your families, with your children. Um, multicultural Mental Health. I love that website because it actually has um, resource sheets in various languages. So excellent thing to check out. Um, Psychology Today and the College of Psychologists if you're looking for private psychology and um, the Employee Assistance Service also has a great website, government funded programs that you can access. Uh, as for parent specific support, um, our colleagues Pleo are here and they are awesome. They all run groups. Um, the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centre has a great uh, website with regards to finding things locally. Parents for Children's Mental Health are not currently running any groups. However, they do offer virtual support. So um, awesome place to look. Um, the Association of Parent Groups and Autism Ontario and Center for ADHD are also uh, excellent areas to find some things for helpful for parents. Uh, with regards to young people, um, some online, sometimes it's easier to type to people or text to people than it is to uh, talk face-to-face. Uh, -face. So these um, ministry-funded websites, Big White Wall and Bounce Back, have both been initiated in the last few years and um, they have some pretty good reviews. So uh, that would be something you'd encourage your child to be part of. And then make sure that they are aware that the kid's help phone is there and they can either call or text. There are several, each region has a lead agency um, that is responsible for delivering community funded mental health programs. Um, so each region has a different mental health. It would be really um, time consuming for me to actually go through each one. So I will just refer you to the Moving on Mental Health website. If you don't know your children and youth mental health agency in your region, um, if you click on this link, you will find it and then you just look it up by region. So let's go back to Dave, who's sick and tired of the virus, who wants to see his friends, who's not going to get sick, and uh, who's upset at the bylaws officer. So what do we recommend? So first of all, parents take a deep breath and remind themselves that when Dave is in the green zone, he's actually a great kid. So if he's difficult to deal with, then it's because he's more stressed and frustrated. So one of the things we can do is we can try connection for before direction. So when Dave says the virus sucks, we just empathize with that and agree. It sucks this whole situation. And parents try not to be logical and rational by giving him advice. They try and give him the sense of purpose. Let's, uh, let's do something to get busy and help others. How about we make some masks together? We can give them to your friends, give them to the relatives. We can ask the neighbors, especially the elderly ones, if they need help with cutting the lawn or groceries or lawn care. We can respect his teenage need for autonomy by giving him choices over what to do. And in terms of Dave saying, I want to go see my friends, you can't stop me, we just accept, yes, we hear you. You want to see your friends, get that. So thank goodness they've relaxed some of the restrictions this week in the province of Ontario. So definitely it's acceptable now to have teens go outside as long as there are no more than five of them, as long as they're physical distancing, talking on the phone. And uh, excuse me if I'm distracted, my kids are screaming in the background. Thanks. Over to you, uh, next slide. So we all have good days, we all have bad days, and so one of the biggest things that we're, we're all having to tell ourselves and other people are, you know, 
did you have a bad day yesterday and everyone just spent the whole day playing video games, nothing got done, it's okay. The most important thing is that we stay calm, that we stay in the green zone. When this time is all over, your kids won't remember what you did or what you said. They're not going to care about the fact that you made them do this homework or that homework, but they will remember how they felt. They will remember that you were calm, that they felt validated, empathized, and accepted. So to summarize everything we've said, our, our main takeaway would be number one, take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself as you would to a good friend. Number two, take care of others, your kids. Make sure or try your best to give them those opportunities to get all the healthy things they need. And if they're upset, just validate that they're upset. And if things are not getting better, mental health services are available and Point number four would be, even though this session is just a quick one-off session, there is support out there. Pleo, for example, is more than happy to be a support for you after this is over. Thank you, Dr. Chang and Cindy. Um, just a reminder that the um, archived materials will be posted on our website in the near future if you are interested in getting um, the slide deck and these amazing resources. At this time, we will move to our question and answer period. We are fortunate to have Elise, Executive Director from PLEO, who will be posing these questions to our hub specialists on behalf of parents and, kink and caregivers. Over to you, Elise. Great, thank you. And, and thank you all so much for submitting your questions in advance. There were some common themes among the hundreds of questions that we received, and they really guided this whole session. So what we put together for you today was based on the specific questions that you all asked. There are a few questions that we're going to start answering now more specifically. Uh, if you don't hear your question, I think they will still provide some helpful information because they do represent common themes that we saw. And uh, as Dr. Chang said, we're still here for you after the session ends. So if you still have questions, you can reach out to PLEO. You can look at the resources that Cindy provided uh, and hopefully get some, get some support for your unique needs there. So the first question we're going to ask, how do I balance the academic demands with the mental health needs from my teens who are not motivated to engage in schoolwork or even get out of bed when all of their regular activities are canceled? And we'll start with Dr. Kortstein. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. And uh, it can be a real challenge to find the right balance between taking care of your teen's uh, mental health and making sure they're not falling behind academically. So yeah, teenagers, like Mike said, they have a strong need for autonomy. And like all of us, they, they find themselves in a situation they've never been in. So that, that unknown and that prolonged situation we're in that, that causes anxiety. And um, it's really important to, to understand what that anxiety does to us. It actually interferes with our uh, brain that helps us to execute. Our executive functions are the skills that we need to get things done and to get motivated and get started. And under times of prolonged stress, we see that those functions are becoming less efficient. So well, as parents, it's important, it's, it's helpful, it's not maybe important, it's helpful to know that they are not trying to be lazy or willfully um, oppositional, but they, uh, they really are stuck. And um, sometimes we call it the, the, the amygdala hijack. They are stuck. The, the emotional brain is in such override. Even when they don't show that big uh, red zone dysregulation, they may be in that bored zone and they may not be able to get out of that. Um, so keep in mind at this developmental stage, they want autonomy. So us jumping into like our natural reaction for parents is to jump in and to start fixing it. That doesn't work. They want autonomy. It goes against what they need in that developmental stage. So as therapists, what we do, we often get stuck in with unmotivated patients. And it's not because they don't want to, it's, 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 it's something else. And then we pause. And we try to understand what it is that, 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 that's underneath what we call ambivalence, like they don't want to do it. 
Um, and so instead of telling them what to do, we provide and giving them more suggestions, um, we, we, we like to stop and connect. So Mike talked about connect before direct. So first get the connection. And so then the conversation may, so listen, invite them for an informal chat, find opportunities, uh, not for a formal talk like this, these are the rules, but like a different kind of conversation. And once you move into that kind of way of being with them, you can talk about their goals. What are their goals? What would, like, would, they, what would they like to accomplish during this time? Um, and then you can share your expectations, but be careful that you don't uh, escalate that into conflict. Because once, once you have conflict, you no longer have them to work with you. Offer to brainstorm with them, uh, and when you take on this kind of approach, they probably will want to do that with you. Praise them for their problem solving skills and for expressing themselves. Um, ask them how you can help them with carrying out their plan. And um, keep in mind that they have really missed the socialization and the learning at school. And, um, you know, even though they're not learning all the academics, maybe the same way they would have learned when they would be in school, They've, once we look back on this time, I'm pretty sure we will all be able to identify what they have learned and they may be even more important life lessons than, um, you know, falling behind in uh, academics a little bit. Okay, hand it over to Mike or to Elise. I don't have anything to add to that. Thanks, Simone. So the only thing I would add to that is um, checking out the Parenting Teachers Academy. It's an excellent website just to get some resources and some ideas. And I fully agree with what Simone is saying with regards to having opportunities to be with them so that it uh, provides some opportunity for you to have discussion about um, what the barriers are to them um, carrying out their activities. Because um, I always have the theory of Children don't wake up in the morning and say, I just don't want to do anything or have any motivation. So there's something driving it. So spending the time with them engaging in activities uh, can provide opportunity um, for them to talk to you about what's going on with them. Go ahead, Christy. Hi, uh, I'm Christy. Uh, and everyone at PLEO is a parent with lived experience supporting their youth or young adult with mental health challenges. So. Um, my answers reflect my, my experience, but I'm um, talking to the classroom teacher too about what is actually necessary in terms of, of passing for academics. Um, as far as I was aware, whatever mark they had um, at March 13th, they can't go below that. So sometimes that too is um, unmotivating uh, for them to continue. But um, you know, obviously, you know, if you've had a discussion with them about what possible plan there could be put in place and you've tried to, there were some great ideas from the panel about working with them and problem solving and supporting them. I'm going to more speak to the families that have an inflexible child um, and they've tried that many times and it isn't working out. Um, and, uh, you know, so it might just look like what, what possible structure can we set up for you then that would engage you to get out of bed, right? What, what things do engage them? Um, even if it's small, walking the dog in the morning, doing a project um, that they're working on with you. Um, a few of our parents whose youth were sleeping until the middle of the afternoon um, in the autonomy that Dr. Chang was talking about decided to go out and get a part-time job. And it was like a miracle happened because it was 8.30 in the morning and the child was out of the house on their bike headed to their part-time job. And as much as there was other things to factor in there, um, but it impacted the sleep cycles for better. It gave them a little bit of a social circle. It also helped them feel like maybe they were helping um, a bit during this time in the pandemic. And it was just a healthier thing for them to be having something to get up for and to get out of bed, even if it was three or four hours and to get moving. And they came home feeling much better about themselves, which is what we want to see. Um, ultimately at the end of the day anyways. So over to you, Elise. Great, thank you. So the second question we have, my 16 year old son does not abide by the pandemic rules. He meets up with his friends no matter what we say or do. 
consequences aren't working? Do I still pressure him to do his homework, not smoke weed or follow the rules? What do we allow and what do we fight and how? And I'll pass it to Dr. Quartz. Yeah, so this time I'm going to pass it to Mike. Go ahead. Well, I think uh, challenging situation. So this is a good one where if, if your expectations are not working and the expectations are just causing conflict, then we want to reduce and change the expectations. We want to reduce the expectations and focus instead on rebuilding the connection with the youth. So we would um, try and back off on the expectation for, um, for homework, for example. Uh, in terms of not smoking weed, we would, we would think about negotiable and non-negotiable. So non-negotiable non things might be no weed in the home, but negotiable would be, well, we accept that weed is important to you, so you know, we can't stop you if you're outside of the home. And, and in terms of the relationship, we would really wanna focus on how can we improve the relationship between this teen and parents? Is there a way we can get the teen spending time with parents, uh, some shared preferred activity? And during those activities, it would not be about uh, talking about let's go over your homework for today or let's go over this. We wouldn't talk about anything stressful. It would just be focusing on positive things. So if the teen says, I had a great time today with my friends, we would just validate that. I'm so glad you had a great time. And even if it was uh, doing something breaking COVID restrictions, we would bite our tongue and just leave it for now. So those would be some of my suggestions, just focusing on the relationship and reconnection first. And then after that, we would, uh, be able to focus on other things. So over to Simone or the next person. <laughs> that would be me. And I think I'm going to pass on next. I think I don't have anything to add. Over to Christy. Um, so I know that there are ways for them to see their friends and be six feet apart and um, be in compliance. Uh, I also know that that is not what many of our families are dealing with and coping with their youth. Um, that are out hanging out with their friends. So um, I would just say, you know, one thing is you're not alone in the struggle. And we do suggest you pick your battles um, because what is the most critical is that you keep a good relationship with your teen. Um, you might want to have measures in place to protect the rest of the family. Um, one family that had a good idea, they had a little cleaning station in their garage where the youth could change their clothes and wash their hands before they came in the house. Um, having a discussion with the teen about what will the plan be? Are you, know, are you gonna be allowed everywhere in the house? Are you allowed in your bedroom, in the bathroom? And you wipe down the surfaces in the kitchen. As figuring out some of those things, especially if there is someone susceptible in the home. And sometimes one friend or one girlfriend um, can be very impactful in their life, in their mental health. And so, um, you know, sort of not letting them see them can, can have a lot of negative consequences, both um, with their mental health and also with your relationship. Um, for the drugs, um, you know, that certainly that's something that our families cope with quite a bit. And um, I mean, you can have, you should have boundaries for drugs within your home, but can't stop them from using and they'll go out somewhere else and use, right? So it's stressful at home um, as it is, and you just wanna make sure that um, your relationship isn't being whittled down by the little fights all the time. And the flip side, that you're doing things that build memories and that build some positive times together as well. So over to you, Elise. Thank you. So the third question we have, my 16-year-old autistic teenager has been threatening to run away or kill himself, or he says he wants to die. It happens when he doesn't get his way, so I'm not taking him seriously, but how do I change or redirect his attention? We all walk on eggshells because we don't want to upset him, but he can't always have his way. Also, when he's bored, he is destroying things like my good dining room chairs or rocking chair. Dr. Quartzday. To Mike? So this is a this is a complicated one. There definitely seems to be some significant struggles with self-regulation. So we can give some quick tips today, but definitely this may be a more complex case where you'll need to speak to some professionals uh, with expertise in working with kids on the spectrum. 
but if I look at it from a self-regulation perspective, we have troubles in the board zone that when he's bored, he doesn't know healthy ways to keep him occupied. And this is part of a problem in our modern society, right? Like in the old days, teens would have had lots of things to do on the farm. That destructive ability could have been harnessed by him going outside and chopping firewood, uh, gathering firewood, and those would all have been natural outlets. So the suggestion would be, are there any other ways, any healthy outlets we can give him to use up that energy? Uh, any um, chopping firework that can be done, uh, flattening boxes for the grocery store, um, other things. In other zone that there seems to be issues are our red zone. He gets overwhelmed and then he goes into the red zone and he says he wants to die or run away. And so when you're in the red zone, there's not much you can do aside from just give space and let them calm down. And um, hopefully then they come into the yellow zone. So yellow zone is where he's frustrated, he's emotional, and that's where we can validate, wow, it's not easy when you don't get your way. It's not easy when you have to stop using the computer. It's not easy when you want this and that doesn't happen. So we would just, in the yellow zone, we would just validate that. And hopefully, eventually he get back, gets back into the green zone. And green zone is where you might be able to talk to him and list what are all the things that trigger this kid to get into the yellow zone. And during the green zone, this is critical. This is where you can actually say, what would you like us to do? Or what can we do to help you calm down? We know you probably don't want us yelling at you. We know you probably don't want us, you know, yeah, um, doing other things that you don't like. What can we do to help you feel calmer? And so the, um, my answer to this question is ultimately, there might be some self-regulation planning that can be done when we're calm in order to help with this. Ultimately though, if you do become worried about safety, then that's when we would recommend calling something, something like a crisis line uh, in order to help you assess to see if there is a concern about suicide. And over to the next person. The only thing I would add to that is making sure that you have a safety plan in place um, in the beginning, like before, when he is calm, so that we know what the reaction to, to how to manipulate that when he's struggling. Um, so the Be Safe app has an opportunity for you to actually put the safety plan in there, and it also will allow you to put in the crisis lines and stuff so you have them. Um, the other thing I would add is that Autism Ontario does have a navigator, so they can kind of um, guide you as far as uh, accessing services. So I know there's very limited autism resources in the homes, but there are some that are still continuing. So check out the Autism Ontario website and see what they have. And they know that there's a navigator named Kelly who is helping people figure out what resources will work best for them. So obviously I'm answering as a parent with lived experience, not a clinician. But first of all, I can say that uh, I can sympathize very much with stuff getting broken on a regular basis. And um, I just want you to know, you know, we're, we're here for you to walk with you. I strongly agree with everything that's been said about the coping and safety plan and knowing your crisis numbers. Some, from what I have found, some autistic, some children with autistic tendencies do best with a very predictable schedule. So where they know the boundaries and things are not changing daily. So possibly creating one with him um, when he's in a calm time. If he participates in it, he may have more buy-in into it. I have a schedule for my 15-year-old on the fridge and he has referred to it when upset that something is not as expected, which also shows me that he's paying attention to it. Um, and it's probably not eliminating, but it, it is probably reducing the amount of issues we have, and I will take reducing. Um, for boredom, I think too much time on their hands is a bit of an inevitable situation right now, and uh, it's not possible to program every minute. Getting uh, out the pent-up energy is, I think, a good starting point, going for a walk, a bike ride, doing anything physical. Um, I have found that those, some of the websites online, they're, they're good, but sometimes the activities are only last like 10 to 15 minutes. And then I'm back at square one and I'm like, I need a much longer term, I need a much bigger solution than that for periods of time. And I found it really helpful to tap into what things um, are, there in, are they interested in. 
what things engage them. Is it art? Is it, you know, trains? Is it science or, you know, computers getting inside of a computer and taking one apart? What can he do that he can tinker at? Um, and so for my son, music, music is, has infinite possibilities and, um, he'll sit down at an electric keyboard and he'll make a, like a, a tune or a ditty and then he kind of uploads it to a, a program and then he's able to add the drums and the bass and he can play for hours doing that. And it's not, it's, he's mostly on the piano fooling around. Also, I find, um, if I were to come home and be like, here's a coloring book and a pack of markers, he would say, that's ridiculous. You're being stupid. I'm not a kid. But I do find that if it's laying around the house and it's pretty good, you know, new markers and a new coloring book, like it gets used. He'll pull it out. He's bored. And it's just a great little activity. Um, and it, it, he takes advantage of it if it's laying around. Another thing I'd say for this mom is walking on eggshells. Um, with a youth that's volatile is exhausting. And you need to get some breaks for yourself. You need to get out of this tense environment for some time, go for a drive, go for a visit with a friend to the park, um, even taking a walk and just looking up at the clouds as you're walking, getting a different perspective. Self-care is so critical. And it's really hard um, when we're in the moment of caring for somebody uh, to, to take that time for ourselves, but we need to do it. We need to do it for them as well. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge self-care goal. It can just be a coffee by yourself on the back step or something that refreshes you that, um, you know, that you can go back and, and you're just in a different place when you return. So over to you, Elise. Great, thank you. I'm gonna squeeze in one last question just because I think it's a, an important one. Um, I work full time and I'm exhausted at the end of my work day, but still have to deal with my daughter's bipolar disorder and anxiety about the pandemic. Her moods and behavior dominate the house and I'm at my wit's end. Dr. Quartz Day. So, you know, I can just imagine how overwhelming that must be. Um, we are all, like I said earlier, we're all under prolong what we call prolonged stress, and we don't know when it's going to lift, and it does something to our minds. And for us who are self-reflectors, we actually can feel it, like we're all tired and exhausted. So I, I just wanna tell you, we, your daughter and you are under a lot of stress, and so I just wanna validate it, because I know that Mike and I, Mike and I would say the same thing, so I'm going to pass it to Mike. Yeah, so, a uh, complicated situation for tough situations. Sometimes I, I first start with just accept that no matter what we do, you may still have these issues. Um, accept that no matter what you do, your daughter may still have these raging moods that are horrible. And so we may have to simply accept that. This is an unprecedented time as well. On the other hand, as I hear this, one thing I definitely hear is that you're exhausted. So it tells me that we need to think, is there any way we can get you more support? Uh, is it possible that uh, there's other family that can help out in any way? Is it possible that any of the professional supports can help any way? Uh, such, uh, or the family support such as Pleo? Uh, it also makes me wonder, because you mentioned bipolar, it makes me wonder uh, that somewhere in the history, there has been a professional that's been involved that probably knows your daughter. And so I would be curious to see what that person might have in terms of recommendations. Uh, mental health providers are still working. We're just doing virtual. Uh, so those would be some of my quick answers for the time we have, and there'll be more in the written summary. Over to the next person. I'm gonna pass on answering this one so that Christy can have the last word. Okay. You're not alone. It, this is not Pinterest parenting. This is very hard. And you also can't pour from an empty cup. And so self-care is so critical. Like either doing it with her, sometimes you can just say, hey, let's go for a walk together. They don't even realize that it's you know self-care. They don't even realize that it's healthy for them and good for their mind and everything. Um, or watching a movie, funny movie together. But even if she doesn't want to join you, 
you need to get out and do something that restores you. And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be time consuming. It can be like every day I need to get the mail. I don't need to get the mail every day, but I need to get the mail. And I'm going to go out to the mailbox and I'm going to take some deep breaths out there and I'm going to look around and I just come back. It's like four minutes later and I come back a different person. You know, I come back a little bit more grounded. Finding some of these things, what worked for you before um, in terms of uh, refreshment for you? Was it nature? Was it art? Was it faith? Was it gardening? Um, if you did it before, is there a way you can start to incorporate doing it now? Um, and it's also modeling for her. It's modeling for her um, how to cope with your own emotions and uh, great ways of, of um, you know, getting outside and um, you know, just coming back, feeling calmer and feeling more grounded and having someone to talk it out with. Like it's really helpful to have someone to process it out with and just be able to talk and talk and when you're done, you have a bit of a different perspective because you've been able to kind of get it out. And that's what we do at Pleo all day long. And, you know, we're people that have folks that have been there and it's not us uh, judging or telling you of anything to do, but helping you just find your own way and your own strength. Over to you, Elise. Great. Thank you so much to all of you for the questions and also for the, all of those uh, suggestions and I'll pass it to Jason. And it's now time for us to wrap up. Thank you to our panel today and thank you for joining us for today's session. As mentioned, the archive materials will be posted on our website, so please keep checking back. We also have materials on there for the last session that was presented on April 30th with a focus on children up to the age of 12. Project ECHO Ontario Child and Youth Mental Health continues to offer no-cost virtual education sessions to primary care providers. So family doctors, pediatricians, nurses, and so on. You can tell your doctor, nurse, or primary care provider about our program so they can learn more about child and youth mental health. They can find more information on our website. Your feedback is very important to us. You will receive a survey for today's session. We appreciate you taking the time to fill this out so we can continue to improve these sessions. Thanks again for joining us and I wish you all a great day. Stay well.